Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Right Wing here on Civically Minded. I'm your host, Corey Wing. I'm thrilled to announce that for our first ever episode, I was able to sit down with candidate for U.S. House of Representatives in North Carolina's 8th District, Lee Brown. Lee is a wife, a mother of two. She's a graduate of UNC at Chapel Hill and a lifelong resident of Cabarrus County. She's an award-winning author, as well as a speaker and a longtime realtor. She's a former colleague and a family friend. I was able to sit down with Lee and discuss many topics, including the chaos at the southern border, things that she thinks need addressed in Washington on day one should she be elected, as well as the intersectionality between her faith, her business, and now her political aspirations. Stick around for a wonderful interview here on The Right Wing on Civically Minded. Well, I'd like to say welcome to my special guest, Lee Brown, and thank you for your time today. Lee is a long, lifelong resident, correct, of Cabarrus County, North Carolina? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And a proud graduate of UNC at Chapel Hill. She's a wife, a mother of two. She's a speaker, an award-winning author, and a former president of the North Carolina Association of Realtors. Realtors, pardon me. I did not, I, I, how did I say it wrong? I, I... Your dad will come back from yeah. beyond. And yeah, he, 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 would sla- he would slap me. Uh, she's an entrepreneur, a longtime realtor herself, and she has sold over 3,000, is this number right, over 3,000 homes in the greater Concord area? It might be 4,000. I don't know. To go back and count them is going to take more time than I've got the patience to do. <laughs> I, I understand that. I understand that. She's been an advocate for realtors and home ownership, of course. And she's probably got more real estate acronyms after her name than anyone I've ever seen in the business. And I, too, have been a realtor for about 18 years and come from a three-generation real estate family. So I've seen some realtors. And and Miss Lee has more acronyms than anyone I've ever seen. So it's a testament to her continued pursuit of learning and uh, her growing in her profession. And I, I respect that immensely. And in her free time, of which I'm not sure how she finds any, she likes to run marathons and she likes to work with your chickens. I I, I saw that as well. You like to raise your chickens. Yeah. I, I have goats and cattle, so I understand. We and want goats. We'll talk about goats later. Let me know. We, yeah, I can hook you up with a goat guy. And you play piano, I hear. I do. So so that's that's pretty neat too. So thank you for your time today. I know you're very, very busy. And I know that one thing you want to add to that very impressive resume is God willing, come November, you'd like to add the title. U.S. House of Representatives for North Carolina's 8th District. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, you want to be the change you want to see, right? Absolutely. Well, tell me, I'd love to start out this way, if you don't mind. I'd love to have you tell us about your platform and then kind of what would be some distinctives of uh, a Lee Brown legislature, you know, as far as if you move into that role, what would a Lee Brown platform look like? And what are some of the immediate concerns in Washington that you think need addressed on day one? Oh, gosh. So that's about 14 questions in one. So it's obviously proof that you're a wing. So let's think about the the bigger picture. When you look at a primary race, I think all of us say we agree on the general topics on the Republican side of the ticket, which is my side of the ticket. But where we differ, I, I'll just start with pro-life because I have given birth two times. I believe my perspective is a little different than my competitor's. But the Republican Party keeps being told right now that it's a losing conversation and nobody should talk about it because voters don't like it. In my personal opinion, it's because the Republicans keep doing what King Solomon found couldn't be done, which is split the baby. And the Bible is going to give us the information we need to make good decisions every time. The Republican Party keeps saying, is it 12 weeks, six weeks, 20 weeks? You know, pick some weeks out of the calendar. To me, if you believe that life is in the womb, then life is in the womb. And you're either conception or not. It's just that simple to me. My competitors don't have quite as definitive a stance. And it it could be because they haven't experienced what I've experienced with being on the board of directors for Pregnancy Resource Center. I've, I've seen how these young ladies come in And I see what happens when they're introduced to the options of not ending that life. And I've also seen what happens when they do go down that road and they're traumatized every day by what they decided to do. So it's a 
interesting space to be in. But again, I'm I'm guided by the Bible when I look at my decisions and my opinions. That's my North Star because it's not a dead document. It's a living document that gives us life. The other topics, the number one thing we have to deal with right now, I think without question, is the border. And my frustration is that we've conflated the immigrant topic to act like all immigrants are bad. Well, that's not fair or accurate. We all should agree that those who are willing to follow the laws and bring their own work ethic and talent to the country, they're willing to stand in line, do the paperwork, file the fees. That's who we want here. The country was built on a great influx of amazing people. But the problem we have with the ones who aren't willing to follow those rules, they are doing whatever they can to avoid the paperwork and the laws so that they can receive free benefits. But the free benefits are coming along at the price of American safety with fentanyl pouring over the border. It's killing our young people. And then we look at the sex trafficking, which is a huge problem in North Carolina, specifically here in Cabarrus County, right over at Concord Mills is one of the hubs of sex trafficking. And when I've talked to the police about it, the challenge they have is you have to catch these people in the act. Well, they're coming in. And for any viewer or listener who wonders why that might be, you're so close to the intersection of 85 and 77. And so the bad guys can come in, do their bad deeds, and then disperse like cockroaches in the light. You have to stop it at the source. And the source is at the border because these young ladies and these children, women are coming in. And human slavery is what it amounts to. But it's got to get stopped. And it's not a, an incremental thing. It's very, very similar to the pro-life decision. You're either for it or against it. So you got to shut it down. And then we have to deport as many of these illegals as we can find. And that's going to be hard because they've infiltrated our communities. And, and I just don't think those are good guys, Cody. I think the, the I call you Cody. I called you Cody. You're that's Corey. Okay. That's Cody's right. my favorite city in Wyoming though. So I'll just, I'll just add that in. But the reality is if bad guys are here, and they're hiding from us, they're not really looking to bring good and betterment to our communities. And as a mother of a 19-year-old daughter, I don't think she's safe by herself in many instances right now. As a runner, I don't feel safe in the places I used to feel safe just because I don't know who's around the corner and what their what their goals are. So that's got to be addressed right now. And the frustration I have looking at our current government is this constant incrementalism of giving in, giving in, giving in, instead of saying, no, we have principles and we do have a sovereign border. We do have the right to exist with freedoms and with safety and other people can be welcomed in, but not at the detriment of those who are already here. I think we all pretty much agree on that as candidates. The question becomes, how do you get things done? And I do think the biggest challenge that anybody has in D.C. right now is being able to stand on foundational principles and being able to withstand the negativity. Dan Bishop's done a great job of that. I think he's been exemplary as an elected official for knowing who he is and what his beliefs are and then standing on. And that means that sometimes he's in the news because he's going against the grain and sometimes we never hear from him because He's just doing the work behind the scenes. And I think that's an admirable way to be and it's how we survive in real estate. That's to me, the unique ability I bring to the table is in our business, as you know, we only win somebody over by focusing on the problem at hand. And if we're wanting to sell a house, we find out why they're selling, what's going on in their life. And we ask questions and then we personalize the solution but we don't walk in and say, well, what do y'all want? Let's just do whatever you want because that doesn't work. And the same thing with our buyer clients, they're not ever going to win a house if we let them drive the train because they don't know the pitfalls. They don't know the competitive landscape. They don't know what the house is worth. And our job is to guide and bring knowledge to the table, but without doing it this way. And I think that's the the attitude that's hurting us right now is this my way or the highway is coming from one side. The other side is just caving all the time. Mm. So there's an opportunity here to be firm and friendly and personalized and focused, which is frankly what this mom does. And as I like to tell people, if I can't be canceled by two teenagers, I can't be canceled by a Twitter mob either. <laughs>
Well, and, and it's that that's going to lead into a question I've got here in just a second, actually. But I love what you said there was so helpful. I think that we've and this is happening in the church as well. You're seeing it in, in civic in the civic realm, but you're seeing it in the churches as well. The zero sum game all the time, you know, of so you want common sense solutions at at our poorest would be kind southern border. At, at this point, we don't even have a southern border. And well, if you want that, then you're on the wrong side of history, and and you you must not like any kind of immigration. And I'm like, well, no, that's that. It's not a zero sum game all the time. And and then because of our cultural zeitgeist, which changes almost breath by breath, if you don't have these foundational truths that are found, as you said, in Scripture, you know, where where we have a transcendent God who created all things, and because he is transcendent, stands outside of time and space, he can then give good law, which this nation, I don't care what anyone says, was founded on. This nation was founded on his law. And if we forget that transcendent law, then we are grasping at air. And and so I, I find it very beneficial what you said, and I, I appreciate you speaking about um, uh, the incumbent, Dan Bishop, and uh, because this would be the, the seat he's been filling now for the last few years. Um, I, I will try to, to 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 narrow the scope on my next question, but uh, but you you did bring up. I'm gonna I'm actually gonna skip over something. You did bring up, um, and then I'll circle back because you brought up can, a cancel mob. You you tried to run for vice president of N NAR, which is the National Association of Realtors, and you were deemed inadmissible, um, and you were canceled in essence uh, okay. for 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 some stuff. So so based on that experience. Um, how has this experience for what is, let's be honest, a much larger office, and and what is kind of your take on on this whole concept of cancel culture here in America? Well, you know, you and I are medium aged, and we remember when political incorrectness came into to being, and we thought it was a joke, and we treated it as such. We did not treat it as the infiltration of somebody else's worldview into ours, and we we should have. We all should have seen what was coming earlier. Because now we're being told that if we don't do as told and think as told and agree and celebrate and advocate as told, then we must be removed from society. And it is the opposite of how the country was founded. The country was founded by people who came here seeking a chance to live differently and live with each other and have a voice because our founding fathers didn't have a voice over in the countries where they came from because there was such classism they came here to say, we want a way to, to worship our God. We want a way to own property. We want a way to create an economy and we want a voice in that. And that's what goes away in cancel cultures. You take away the voice of somebody because you deem them unworthy simply because they don't agree with your opinion. And whether people want to admit it or not, it's only coming from one side, the side that is in favor of the progressive worldview wants to burn down you and me because we don't agree with them. Our side, because we are shaped by a biblical worldview, is always thinking, well, how can I how can I reach them? How can I bring them into the kingdom? How do I teach them that God has a place for them too? But instead of that being received as a message of hope and, and goodness, because God created all things for good, and I think that's forgotten in today's world, we're trying to expand the good and the other side is coming in to destroy the good. And I I hate to reduce it to good and evil, but that's what we're dealing with right now. If it were really a culture war, that would be two cultures fighting against each other. And that's not what's happening. We have good versus evil right now. And it's becoming more and more visible in the world. But I do believe good wins. And good doesn't win by necessarily destroying evil. Because if you if you look straight at the scriptures, Satan was cast into the pit. And he wasn't eliminated. He was cast into the pit because he would not accept God. And so when you think about the opportunities of where we are in leadership, I look at everything as a chance to reach people and, and bring them to a place where they can receive the love and grace and forgiveness, not to destroy them, but to, to open the door, open the door. I mean, the, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few, right? It's all That's happening right. right here in real time. And, when I got canceled at my trade association, your trade association, where we have served for years, where 
that's how I know your mom and dad. We served together. And God, I miss your dad so much because he was one of those men of, of principled foundation who always smiled as he told you what he believed. He never looked at his belief system as something that would absolutely harm anybody else. His belief system was love and love as an expectation of you getting better, not as love as do whatever you want, but I love you so much. I want you to live better. That's right. And our trade association has taken a man like your dad, his legacy, my dad, his legacy, your legacy, my legacy, and told us that the way we live is wrong. And when I was told I was too conservative to be allowed to be on the ballot. And so it's the, the wildest thing to me was that it wasn't a decision of the directors. I would have accepted that pretty easily. They were not given the option because I was deemed to be too conservative. And the words that they said was I could be an embarrassment mm -hmm. to the trade association simply for being a conservative and nothing that I've ever said or done would be precluding somebody from owning a home. I mean, We've built our careers on serving anybody who wants to achieve the American dream. But because I didn't fall in line with their worldview, it was pushed me away. And what I've learned, though, as a as a medium aged mom is you don't apologize for your beliefs. And I think that's where they got even madder at me. I did not cave and say, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll go to reeducation camp. I'm a bad person. I said, no, here's what I said. Here's why I said it. And I will defend my viewpoints and I will defend my worldview, but I'm not going to do it with a flame torch. I'm just going to calmly and rationally explain it because that's how I was raised. Be calm, be rational, ask people why, defend your viewpoint, you know, classic debate, point counterpoint, not this emotional firestorm, which takes off. So the, the sad part was there's a lot of members in our trade association who feel like they don't matter. They feel that they're not valued and they represent over half the membership because let's just be honest, the biblical worldview is still over half of society, no matter how you slice and dice the polls. But we've been told that we're the bad guys. And a lot of fellow people who believe with us have started to cave because they think it's in their best interest in the eyes of the world. It's in their best interest to get a transaction done is to, to be nothing. Well, I'd rather be something today and get canceled than be nothing when I'm standing before my Lord and Savior. Amen. I, I, it, it's an amazing thing that we have come into a day and an age, and, and you're right, I'm a medium-aged dad. Um, we've come into a day and an age where to say that you love someone means that you wholly accept everything uh, that, that they do. And any parent would tell you that that's insane, you know, that that I have three kids, I have an eight-year-old daughter, I have a soon-to-be five-year-old son, and I have a 15-month-old daughter. And they're the, they're the world to me. And my wife and I do everything we can to raise them, as the Bible says, in the fear and the admonition of Christ. And, and I tell my kids all the time, you will have tons of friends over your lifetime, and your friends will, will come alongside, and they will pat you on the hiney, and they'll tell you that every idea that you have is great, but you only get one dad. And it is my job to remind you that not every idea you have is great and, and that there are some things that will harm you. And, and um, again, you knew my father well and, and I still know my mom. I will never forget the day that my dad drove two plus hours or right around two hours down to Columbia, South Carolina. I was a grown, as, as society would say, a grown man. I was in college. I was probably 20, 21 at the time. And he surprised me one day and said, son, you're not taking this seriously. Get in the car, we're going home. This is expensive for you not to take seriously. And I got in the car because I knew he meant it. And, and, the, and because he had raised me in a particular way, I knew he was right. You know, and, and, and I don't, I didn't begrudge him then. I certainly don't now because many of those life lessons helped shape me into the man that I've become. And so if we allow our culture, whether, again, whether it's in the civic realm or in the ecclesiastical church realm, or even in our families, if we allow our culture to degradate to the position where I'm okay, you're okay, let's never hold each other accountable for anything, well, then you, you get the mess we're in, you know, and, and where, where you can't tell me if a boy's a boy, a girl's a girl, I, I, I mean, we don't know what gender is, we don't know what law is, and, and Scripture says in Proverbs that when the wicked rule, the people groan. 
but when the when the righteous rule, they rejoice. And that's just a blanket statement. You know, God doesn't have to feel like he has to qualify that statement because honestly, it, it's so common sense on its face. You know, so so I again thank you. Very helpful answer. Um well, and think about it too. So when you when you look at what happens in obviously chronicles and judges in that whole section of the Bible that so many people want to just blaze by and say, oh, forget the Old Testament. Let's go to the news. It feels good. It's nice and warm and fuzzy. But you look at that era of the judges and so often in biblical study circles, it's called the sin cycles. Mm -hmm. But there's another way to look at that. And that's the redemption cycles. And so every time the people do fall under the weight of wicked rulers who fall away from the Lord, a leader comes along who brings them back to God. And so I've always been the person who says, let's look for the redemption cycle and stop staring at the sin cycle, which is what I believe has to happen with our elected officials. Our government could, instead of perpetuating this problem downhill, what if we look at this as a redemption cycle? And what if a whole new generation of people are willing to stand up and say, I can, I can take the heat on Twitter. I will take somebody from the other side yelling at me and calling me names in order to show the people that there is another way. Mm. And I, I love that you you kind of brought that up with the wicked rulers because they're always followed by somebody good. And, and I have to believe, I have to believe that there is another redemption cycle coming. And in fact, the best redemption cycle is coming. And, you know, that rapture, that glorious day and the will happen in the twinkling of an eye. And we don't know when that's going to be. And so our job in the meantime is to be the the ones who who open that way through being thoughtful and being respected. And so when your dad showed up to put you back on the right path, you listened because of that fear and admonition. But I think we've also misdefined fear as something that is terrifying. But if you look at the original Greek and Hebrew, fear is respect of something greater than you. And so your dad loved you so much that you respected his authority. And that's what we're supposed to do with God. But what's flipped around with that in our elected bodies is that we, the people, are supposed to cower in fear at the feet of our elite electeds, and that's out of order. They're supposed to respect us who elect them, and I do think that when elected, I will probably be the person who spends as much or more time with the constituents of the district than anybody else simply because I know exactly who I am, where I'm coming from, and who sent me to this job if elected, and that's their voice. It's not for me to go be, I'm Lee Brown, and I'm going to do things my way or the highway. It's what does this district need? What does this district want? How do I put a message together that benefits the the people? And that's the way it was designed, and if we get back to that, well, then we'll be in a redemption cycle. Amen. Amen. Last question. And I'm I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Cause again, I know how busy you are and I really am grateful for your time. Sadly, we can talk all day because this is my favorite stuff to talk about. Uh, you and me both. We'll, we'll do lunch sometime. I, I would, we need to, it's been a long time. We need to catch up anyhow. Uh, as a realtor, as someone with that kind of a background and, and really that being your bread and butter for decades now, and, and someone who has advocated at, at the highest levels, at least in our state and even nationally, um, I think a lot about property ownership and property taxes. And, and you see what's going on in France. You see what's going on in Germany where these farmers are saying, you're bringing in, you know, Ukrainian wheat, you're bringing in, you know, things at prices we can't sell for. You're raising our taxes to such high levels that we can no longer pay the tax debt on land that my family has maybe owned for a hundred, 200, 300 years. Some of these French landowners are going back to, to, land grants given by kings. You know, I mean, they, this should not even be a question as far as I'm concerned. Um, that, but how do we view property tax and, and, and the, the, the federal government or even the state government's ability to, through, through the raising of taxes or even through eminent domain, just coming in and taking that which we are told on the surface is ours? Well, that goes to the hashtag that floats around on Twitter a lot with taxation is theft, because it is. And this country operated fine without taxation until it was brought in to finance wars. And of course, the Bible says there will always be wars and rumors of wars. We know that piece of it. But 
the reason it's continued to escalate is because the spending has escalated. And you and I can't operate our households like that. You can't operate a church like that. You've got a budget. You're basing it on tithes. And frankly, you're you're guessing that your your congregation will tithe. You don't have any way of knowing or forcing it. That's right. But when a church believes that the people will support the mission, God provides. And you don't have to put a tax on your people to keep the church floating. With property owners, well, just look at the community, right? So one of the excuses for charging so much in taxes is we have to provide a, set, a public safety net. We have to provide this and that and the other, the free stuff. Well, the church has done that historically. And our communities always have. Somebody was down, the community came together and fed them. I mean, I, I have a nine by 13. It's always getting filled up and used. In fact, I, I fed a dear friend on Sunday because her husband is ill. And that's what we're told to do in the Bible and how we're supposed to act as a community. I didn't have to be taxed into that. So if we think about the fact that we can operate without them, well, that's a mindset shift. And then you start to look at the spendings. What, what can we stop spending on? I look at the current spending bill, this ridiculous bipartisan border bill, which has more money for foreign entities and foreign borders than it does for our own, which is our safety. Well, if I'm paying taxes on my property, I want to know that it's benefiting my community, my country, not elsewhere, but we're unwilling to have a very honest spending conversation, even though the public is having it, our electeds are ignoring it. And that's what's happening in Europe is that the farmers said, you know what, if you're going to ignore us, we're going to force you to hear us by dumping piles of manure all over the parliament building. And I'm just sitting over here cheering when I see them doing that because they're expressing themselves. The question is, will the elites cave or will it have to descend further into into more violence before the people actually have a voice now with that being said if you fix the spending you don't have to continue raising taxes but we also have to learn to say no to to pet projects i look at our financial misbehavior it's all the way i can I, you know, my mother hat just comes on y'all are not acting right these spending bills are 1400 pages long they're all omnibus bills so the elected officials don't know what they're voting on. They've admitted as such. The public doesn't know what's being voted on. All they know is that everything's more expensive. Inflation is hitting and they're waiting on the Fed to play games with the rates. And that is just not good economic theory. When if the elected officials had to vote on each separate spending item, if you broke that 1,400 pages up and made them sit there and vote item by item, you'd suddenly find, oh yeah, there's things we should spend money on. Oh, there... What, what are we doing this for? Why are we spending a million dollars in Uganda to help support trans ways of life? And if you think I'm making that up, y'all, you got to look at some of these spending breakdowns. And that's where I'm grateful for Twitter because there's so many breakdowns. You would start saying, wait a minute, that's that's not what my dollars are for. No, it's not. And that goes back to the heart of whose dollars are being spent. The government is not a net producer of anything. The government is the consumer and they're a consumer of taxpayer dollars. Taxpayers need to take that power back and say, you're going to show me what's going on. You're going to be transparent. You're going to answer for what you're saying yes to, which all goes to maybe we should have term limits. And I've caused a little bit of a ruckus because I'm very definitive on term limits when a lot of folks say, but the bureaucracy is the problem. Well, the bureaucracy is the problem. But if you had elected officials who knew they were not running for re-election two more times, they had one more cycle to get some stuff done, they'd probably crack down on some of the spending because they're not going to be able to get the largesse of the people forever. So I, I will say one more thing about property taxes and property rights from a real estate perspective. In our area of Charlotte, where we have such a, a growing area, great jobs, great quality of life. We just, we love living here. I mean, our, your family, my family, we've been here forever. So much of our housing stock is owned now by hedge funds, institutional investors. That's what takes the community feeling away too. And it's not that renters are bad because some people rent for different reasons, but if everything is owned by external people who only chase dollars, you're never going to get that nine by 13 aspect back in your community. That's right. That's right. And and I I was just looking at again that that weird COVID time of when legislatures actually from Washington said that your tenants didn't have to pay rent. And many mom and pop homeowners lost those investment homes, 
just to be gobbled up by those corporate entities that you're talking about, many of which are not even American corporate entities. You know, so so you have all of these huge hedge fund and corporate entities that are now owning, not just in Charlotte, but in Chicago and in New York and in all these major cities. And, and it won't stop there. That's what folks all across the internet that may see this need to understand is it won't stop in the big cities. It will go to the small towns and we will, the, the, the goal, listen to Klaus Schwab and these guys, they are telling you outright what they want. You'll own nothing. We will be God. They don't want to just manage you. They want you to worship them because the heart of man is a heart given by God. We were created in the image of God. You will worship something. It is Christ or chaos. That's it. So you, you have to understand that if it comes down for us Christians to say, legislation must be passed, then I unashamedly say that I want it to be Christian legislation. Amen. Because if it's going to be someone, I, I've now dealt with, I'm 45, be 46 in March. Most of my adult life has been the Overton window going left, 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 left. And I think it's time for us to start pushing it back right. Lee, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your 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 kind smile, your magnanimity, and and your information. It's it's very apparent to me that that you are knowledgeable about what you're running for and what you're passionate about. I think that would do great in Washington. I am wishing you the best. My mother, my brother, and his family would be constituents of yours. So so I am I am rooting for you. And um and, and just thank you so much. Uh, we'll wrap up maybe offline, but uh but thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh huh. Bye bye. Thank you so much for joining me for this first ever episode of The Right Wing on Civically Minded. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful interview with U.S. congressional hopeful Lee Brown. I hope you found it as informative and as entertaining as I did. And I hope that it encourages you to see that there are godly people who are feeling the call to civic duty and they're trusting the Lord and stepping out in faith. They're risking that very cancel culture that Lee and I talked about. And they're saying, Lord, if you'll use me, I will step out in faith and allow myself to be used by you. So I pray that you would uh, be encouraged by that. Maybe say a prayer for Lee and for her family moving forward and pray that God will continue to raise up good candidates to help bring this country back to him and away from the chaos that we've found ourselves for these many years. I hope you come back and join me, of course, here at Civically Minded. If you like what we're doing, maybe leave a like, subscribe, leave me a comment. It does help with the algorithms. And tell somebody else about what we're doing here at Civically Minded. Every Tuesday, I'll bring you a new episode of The Right Wing. And let's, again, think biblically about how to bring our culture back to Christ.